Well, maybe uh, in the interest of time, while we're getting started, I'll introduce uh, Gary. Um, what can I say? I, I've known uh, Gary for a long time. We sort of do the same, broadly, the same kinds of things. He got his uh, PhD from the University of Massachusetts back in back at the same time as me, in which I won't say when. He's been. Uh, been teaching at University of California at Irvine for a while, and he's been at Cornell now for over two decades. Uh, he's a rower. He uh, has an honorary doctorate. He's the only active psychologist that I know who has an honorary doctorate from Stockholm. And uh, what else was I going to put on here? He visits UVic every 30 years. <laughs> he was. He visited me 30 years ago, believe it or not. We were trying to remember what it was, what we were doing and who we were. And we had one flashbulb moment where we were riding our bikes together on Dallas Road, and we both remembered this particular moment. So that's nice. We, had a, we can remember one thing about that previous uh, message, uh, previous visit. And I would say, in conclusion, he's probably the most distinguished environmental psychologist in the world. So I think we're fortunate to have him here. And I hope you enjoy his talk. Gary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming on a Monday afternoon. Um, I thought I'd start out telling you a little bit about why, as a psychologist, I got interested in poverty. And one of the things that's intriguing that I'd encourage you to do if you find this sort of fascinating, as I do, take, go look and go to the library and get a psychology textbook like Intro to Psych, Developmental Psych from 10 years ago and go to the index and look up poverty or social class or SES and it won't be there. And I think this, that's, to me, is really striking. If you look at a modern intro textbook, developmental, social psych, it's getting bigger and bigger in the index. So what's going on? So part of the, part of the reason that I would like to uh, encourage all people who are social scientists, including psychologists, I realize not everyone in the room is a psychologist, because I think psychology has a lot to contribute to an interesting and really important question, which is why is poverty bad for people and why is it bad for children? I would say essentially it's a no-brainer that it's bad for children. There are a few people who have some interesting arguments that challenge that, but I think they're actually pretty easy to refute. But the really interesting and intriguing question, I think, is why is it bad? And it's, that's important for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is if you understand why it's bad, maybe it'll be a little bit easier to try to figure out what we should and can do or maybe shouldn't do to try to help ameliorate some of what's happening. The other um, reason that I think this is of interest is, like many of you who are psychologists, I was trained in a, essentially a positivist quantitative tradition. So the idea would be if I'm looking at some variable like in my case, something around the environment, because I'm also an environmental psychologist as well as a child psychologist, I was taught to like try to isolate that variable in order to try to understand its causal relationship to some, in my case, childhood outcome. So of course, when you do that, if you're interested in things like housing or crowding or noise or pollution, which are some of the things that I've studied with children, something that immediately comes to your mind, of course, is that, well, there could be another variable that's really important in that, that system, right? And that variable might be socioeconomic status because after all, in most societies, pretty much anyone that I'm aware of, if you're poor, you're more likely to also live in a noisier environment, worse housing, more pollution, et cetera. So how do you in fact look at noise and reading acquisition if you don't somehow take into account this other variable? So the way I was trained to do that was essentially get it out of the model. So either statistically or methodologically or occasionally taking advantage of some kind of interesting natural or semi-natural experiment, it's not in the model at all. But what if part of the reason why poverty is bad for children or people in general is because of the environment? What if that's actually part of the pathway? So what I've just done by covariating or, or methodologically taking it out, in effect what I've just done is destroy part of what's actually happening. Uh, so, for example, let me give you a concrete example of what I'm talking about. So, one of the things that people who um, study asthma 
have noticed is that there's a very consistent and very strong relationship between income and asthma in children and adolescents. So one of the explanations of that is smoking, parental smoking. So therefore, let's take a look at how income or socioeconomic status is related to childhood asthma, and let's get smoking out of the picture in order to try to understand what's the link between um, poverty or socioeconomic status and asthma. Well, what if part of the link is because your parent is more likely to smoke, and therefore you're exposed to secondary cigarette smoke? So what you've just done is you've taken actually something that's theoretically meaningful, practically meaningful, about the way the world works, and you've distorted that in order to try to understand that relationship. So part of, the, part of what I've been interested in is why is poverty bad? And I think one of the reasons, and by no means am I arguing the only reason, and maybe not even the best reason, but one of the reasons why poverty is bad is the confluence of risk factors. One of the things that we know with reasonable certainty is that when it rains, it pours. So if a child's exposed to the accumulation of a lot of risk factors, that's a lot harder to deal with. It's more likely to stick. It's more likely to have long-term consequences. And it's a lot harder to intervene to change the developmental trajectory. Unfortunately, I think one of the commonalities of many poor children, at least in North America, is this accumulation of stressors. So sort of the punchline of this talk is one of the reasons why I think poverty is bad for kids is because of this confluence of risk exposure. And that could be physical and that could be mental. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about poverty and its links to children's development. That's a pretty small, fast part of the talk. And then I'm going to talk a lot more about this why and this notion of cumulative risk exposure. Um, for those of you who are interested in um, social media and infographics and stuff, this is a fantastic website. It's called Gapminder. If you're not familiar with it, check it out sometime. And uh, this is a depiction, as you can probably tell, of income per person, um, controlling for, not controlling for, standardizing across different currencies and things of that sort, and uh, life expectancy. And there's a couple of really fascinating things about this graph. Some of you have seen this. Many of you, I'm guessing, have not seen this graph. One of the really interesting things, of course, is that the more money per capita for a country, the longer the life expectancy of, for people in that country. So you can obviously see the you know, pretty, pretty good correlation there. So that's one of the things that's interesting. Another really thing that's interesting about this graph to me is the off-diagonals. So you have countries on that graph that are doing worse than you'd expect them to do, like this one. And you have some countries that are doing a lot better than you'd expect them to do, like um, this one or this one, Cuba. So it's just interesting to think about well, what's going on. And then the third thing that's really interesting about this graph, it's, it's not also the case that if you're poor, if you grew up in a poor country, that the life expectancy is lower. But it's a linear relationship. Look at, look at the linearity of these data. Now, part of that could be an artifact because of the ecological fallacy, right? This is aggregate data. So this is income per capita, and it's the life expectancy for a nation. But it turns out when you look at it at the individual level, it looks pretty similar. So this linearity still is there. And of course, there are also some off diagonals, which is intriguing and interesting to think about. I'm going to skip that one because of time. Um, this is a really fascinating graph for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons that I really think this graph is interesting is what if I were to ask you the following question, and you were not looking at this graph. It's fine to look at, but what if I asked you the following question? What do you think predicts better from, to graduate from college? This is the US. Most of the data I have are United States, because that's the country I know the best, and there's a lot of research on this topic in the US. But what if I were to ask you the following question? I think the question, I'm guessing it would be similar in Canada. I don't think anyone's done this analysis in Canada, but I bet it would be similar. What do you think would predict better graduating from college? Your test scores, your standardized test scores in eighth grade, or how much money your family had? OK, you understand the question? What does that graph show you? A dumb, rich kid is just as likely to graduate from college as a really smart, poor kid. Look and look at it and see that yourself. So what about 
education leveling the playing field, creating equal opportunity, something doesn't add up here, right? Um, this is what the situation looks like in the United States for children. So these are children. This is pretty recent census data in the United States. In the US, we use something called the Federal Poverty Line, FPL. So 100% means you're at the poverty line. In the United States, the way that's done is you look at the nutritional needs of a household. You multiply that by three. And that's the, what we call the federal poverty line. So the blue is children that are at or below the federal poverty line in the United States. This is very recent data. The orange is 200% to 100%. So 100% would be the poverty line. So 200%, you're twice the poverty line, all right? So if you were to consider, and I'll show you in a second why you might, that these two together are, quote, low income, that's how many children in the United States under 18, eight, birth to 18. Um, that's what the poverty line is in the U.S. as of 2016. <laughs> For those of you who are parents or old enough to think about having a family, you can see how astoundingly low those are, right? Um, in Canada, which is right there, you have a slightly different system, um, but not dramatically different, but a slightly different system of how you decide what's uh, considered eligibility for various kinds of programs if you're poor. Oh, I got to go that way. <laughs> Um, this, for those of you who are developmentalists, um, you and those of you who are not developmentalists but just good citizens, should all be alarmed at the fact that disproportionately where a lot of the poverty is in the United States, and as I just showed you in Canada, is for very young children. To, today in the United States, one out of four children is born in poverty. One out of four. So not only is this a very large program, hardly any American citizen would know that information. So if you asked, went around and just did a poll, there's actually been a, a couple of these. Ask people how many people are poor, how many children are born poor. People way, way underestimate it. And so it's a really shocking thing to think that a, a very wealthy country like the United States would have a situation like this. So quickly. What do we know about some of the correlates of poverty? Less life expectancy. This one is not now looking across countries. This is within the US. This is household income. And it's looking at um, the relative risk of premature death, which in the US is defined as you die before you're 65. Um, also notice, again, the linearity. I mentioned that to you before. It's pretty interesting. So what it's literally telling you is it's not just that the poor are really worse off. Of course, they are. But there's something about resources, in this case money, maybe education. Of course, many of these are all bundled up together. There's something about this experience of relative deprivation or absolute deprivation that seems to have an effect. Even if you're relatively well off, you're not as good in terms of life expectancy and many, many outcomes as somebody who's really wealthy. Um, just to anticipate something you might think about, it's probably not explained by access to health care. A little bit, but probably not very much. Um, another thing that's interesting, by the way, to think about these is um, often when we compare countries or we think about what's a successful society, one of the things we think about is GNP. Here's a really interesting alternative. How about the slope of that line? How about if we judge societies by the slope of that line? It'd be a really interesting way to kind of make comparisons. So what, what, what's your life expectancy like based on just what family you happen to have been born into? Pretty intriguing notion to think about if we sort of conceptualized what's a good society or a not so good society in those terms. Uh, this is uh, babies, de death during the first year, um, based on maternal education. Again, you'll notice that linearity. These are major typical health problems for elementary school children in the United States and many countries around the world asthma, ear infections, physical injury, physical activity. And again, notice the linearity. Obesity, obesity is not randomly distributed in the population in most countries, including the United States, also including in Canada. 
One of the things that's happening in worldwide poverty is historically, as you might expect, the, a problem of malnutrition or undernutrition. As countries develop, for example, China now has a very, very fast growing problem of obesity. So as the standard of livings go, go up, you actually wind up having this sort of fascinating and somewhat scary kind of turnaround in what's happening in terms of, in this case, a metabolic problem. Um, these are interesting data uh, from uh, Ken Dodge at uh, Duke. And one of the reasons they're interesting, these are national data. So it's a very, very large data set looking at United States um, internalizing, excuse me, this was just externalizing, externalizing symptoms. For those of you who are not familiar with it, externalizing means things like um, aggression, acting out, cheating, when you're a little bit older, maybe substance abuse. So that's the kind of thing this is capturing. Um, and a couple things that are, and then this one, some of you may not be familiar with. Instead of measuring, this is based on, um, I think it's, my memory is, I think it's teachers. Yeah, this is teachers' evaluations of the children's behavior in the classroom. And this is what it, as it implies, this is peer nominated aggression. If you're not familiar with this, it's kind of like a, uh, a sociometric technique. So each child is asked to name, you know, who are the two or three, you know, kids in the class that are most aggressive. And then you triangulate across the whole class, and then that's what you come up with. So this is literally kindergartners telling you about other kindergartners in the class. And this is the teacher's ratings. And as you can see, in both cases, there's this, again, a good deal of linearity also in more these kind of acting out, externalizing problems at pretty young ages. It wouldn't surprise you to know that these things wind up predicting some pretty ne uh, negative outcomes, like criminal behavior, for example, or substance abuse. Um, this is when you first arrive, six years old. Kin so most of, this, most of these kids are in kindergarten. This is your standardized math scores as a function of what income quartile you're in. Um, this also speaks to that earlier graph about what predicts college graduation better, right? So look what's happening. You're already different when you arrive at school. And it doesn't get any better and maybe gets slightly worse. There's some controversy about whether it gets worse or not. There's no controversy that it doesn't get better. That's pretty universally found. Um, Canadian data looks uh, quite similar to this. Uh, percent graduating on time. So basically, have you been retained at all during a year of school? This is an interesting way to look at poverty. Instead of looking at the individual, this is looking at the aggregate. So it's looking at the percentage of people in the school who are eligible for a free or subsidized lunch. So in the United States, based on your income level, you can either get a free or a subsidized lunch. Um, so this is the percentage of kids. So this is over 40% of the children in the school are eligible for a free or subsidized lunch. And this is in a very large school district in California. And as you can see, there's this really interesting relationship. Um, Various kinds of cognitive functioning. A very consistent finding is one of the biggest correlates of poverty in children's development is language development. Um, very, very big. And as you can see, these are um, pretty substantial uh, differences. So this is looking at um, children in Philadelphia. They're all African American. They're in, um, I think it's fifth and sixth grade, if my memory is correct. And as you can see, it's looking at language, long-term memory, working memory, and an executive control test. So these are using some pretty standard neurocognitive kind of test batteries and looking at the differences between kids who are either um, upper, not middle income or lower income. So what's the measure there? Which one? On that last graph, I can't read what the dependent variable is. The, you're looking for the dependent variable? It's effect sizes, the differences in the, yeah. Pardon? Those are huge. Yeah, they're really, it's a really, especially the language, the language ones are gigantic. Yeah, no, not too much problem of false positives there. This is uh, from Martha Farah at Penn, if you're interested, uh, Stephen. It's from Martha Farah at Penn, F-A-R-A-H. Um, this is a, a problem that's used, a, a protocol that's used to look at planning. Uh, sort of trying to figure out how to strategize. Some of you are familiar with this. Basically, you have to move that pyramid from one of the poles to another pole. 
and try to do that in the least number of moves possible. So what it's kind of tapping into is thinking ahead, strategizing, sort of figuring out what's the best way to do this. So this is from the National uh, Daycare Study in the United States, a big study of childcare, thousands of kids. And it's looking at income to needs, which was that federal poverty line, looking at math scores in grade five, and looking at that task uh, in grade three, that planning task. It's called the Tower of Hanoi. If you're a developmentalist, you've probably heard of it before. Um, and in this particular analysis, it's also controlling for IQ. So what I'm trying to do here is just give you a feeling of sort of the breadth of the correlates of poverty or socioeconomic status. So why is poverty bad for kids? I think it has to do, as I said, with the, the environments that they grow up in. So quickly, well, what are some of the characteristics of poverty in the social environment and the physical environment somewhat artificially divided, just in order to talk about it? So in the United States, you're, if you're from a low-income family, you're five times more likely to be divorced. And most people who do these analyses, of course, are aware that divorce can lead to poverty. Most of these studies, or these, um, which are obviously epidemiological descriptive studies, are, are dealing with that to the best of their ability. So m most of these look like it's not that this has been produced by the divorce, but so, and no, again, notice the you know notice the, the magnitude of this effect. Five times, basically, five times more um, children in divorced families if they're low income. Uh, this is a, one of my favorite Jerry Kagan studies, which unfortunately is not very well known. Those of you who are developmentalists, Jerry Kagan was a, a very eminent uh, cognitive developmental uh, psychologist and um, does a lot of work on shyness right now. That's sort of his thing he's been working on most recently and is also interested in arousal. Um, this is looking at uh, maternal child contact, face-to-face -face contact at a very young age. Uh, I think it's about, I think they're a month old, around a month old. So they're not newborns, but they're pretty young. And what's interesting here, and by class he does, this is a socioeconomic status, so it's a composite measure of, I think in this particular study he used income and education and he combined them. Uh, sometimes studies will also throw in occupation. Um, but in this one, I believe it was just income and education. So there are two things that are interesting about this. So these are the intervals. So in other words, this is a short interval of this mother-child face-to-face regard, okay? And so as you go from here to here, you're getting more and more sustained mother-child face-to-face interaction. And you can see what's quite dramatic about this. The short ones, there's not a whole lot happening, but you know, actually a little bit more with less of the short ones in the middle and more of the short ones. But what's really interesting is when you get out into the sustained ones. Essentially, it goes away in those low-income moms. Um, one of the reasons that that might be important, in addition to just having that experience, is there's some reason to believe that this may be one of the ways, particularly very early in life, that you start to see signs of responsiveness or maternal sensitivity which is a fundamental building block of attachment. So it might not just be an interesting sort of psychological phenomenon to observe, which it is, but it might also lead to something that could be pretty important. Um, looking at parenting and older children, speaking to the child, responding to, to the child's verbalizations, that's that responsiveness phenomenon. Physical affection, uh, uh, physical punishment, and as you can see, this is a pretty big data set. This is the famous study looking at uh, Hart and Risley's parental speaking. Um, for those of you in the room who are graduate students, you may not know the story of this study. This was actually discovered by a graduate student. So they were interested in studying the actual language behavior in the home at a very early age, and their interest was then looking at the endpoint of language development. They didn't design this study to study poverty, but it turns out within the study they had Professional parents, as it says, I think we lost, there, there it is, professional parents, working class parents, and parents on social welfare. And as you can see, the numbers, of course, are small. On the other hand, you can also see that the effect sizes are so big that even with those small numbers, you don't need a whole lot of inferential statistics to tell you that there's something really quite different. Um, 
so I really like this study because, among other things, as you can see, they track children every month, uh, every three months, for a very, very long time. Um, and these, these are just gigantic differences. So here you have a child who's growing up in a home where her parents, in this particular example, are literally saying less. They're speaking less to the child. So think about language acquisition. Think about reading. And remember I said one of the biggest impacts appears to be these language-related um, kinds of impacts of poverty. That's where you see those huge effect sizes. This is using the home scale, Bradley and Caldwell's work. So this is a measure of an observer goes into a home and is observing cognitive stimulation. This is that income to needs variable. So this is poverty. This would be, this is where most American families are, they're two to three. And this is four. So this is four times the poverty line. And this is at that poverty line. So what was it? It was about 24,000 for a family of four, as I recall. <clears throat> Parental involvement in school, so how active, how able is the parent to be involved in school? Reading to the child, telling the child a story, taking them to the library, number of books in the home. If you were trying to invent a situation to make it difficult for children to read, how about the following one? Don't talk to the child. Don't be responsive when they talk to you. Don't read and let them watch a lot of TV. Remember the cumulative risk idea, right? So I think here you start to see kind of a nice example of what I'm talking about. It's a really toxic mix. This is looking at the behavior of preschool teachers in nursery schools. So standard observational scale. The observers are blind to the SES characteristics of the nursery school. So this is an aggregate, so we're not looking at the individual, it's not looking at lower class children, it's looking at children in a lower class daycare center and middle and upper. So the teachers behave in a different way. Part of the reason for that is probably things like how well they're paid, their the teacher's education, the ratio of staff to either infants or toddlers. So in some ways, it makes sense, of course, that if you're in a situation where you've got too many kids, not enough staff, you're going to be more likely to be less sensitive, a little more detached, and maybe a little harsher. Years of teaching experience. So this is that um, looking at the number of pr the proportion of kids in the school that are eligible for free or sub subsidized lunch. So how many children are poor in that school? So this is the, the, the most, the highest 20% and the least 20%. So are schools equal? Well, no, they're not. They may have a pretty similar per pupil expenditure. Okay? Increasingly in the US, because of legal action, that's happening. Historically, that was not the case in the United States. But now it's getting more and more even. But there's still lots and lots of differences between schools where poor kids go and rich kids and middle kids go. Also notice the linearity again, by the way. Okay? Because I think that's another intriguing part of this whole story. It's not just that the poor are worse, but there's a, you, you'll see you in the outcome I showed, showed it to you, and you'll keep seeing it in the psychosocial and the physical, this linearity. So I think something's going on here with exposure to social and physical risk factors. Now, if you're a good student, you have to have a test in order to remember something, right? So what's on the y-axis on this one? OK, just to help you out, this was what was on the y-axis on that one, OK? Years of teaching experience, OK? So the richer the school, much more experienced teachers. Where are all the Teach for America kids? Where are all those students sent in the United States? Low-income schools. How much experience do they have? Zero. OK. It's a wonderful program. I'm not trashing the program at all. But th they have no experience. OK. So what's on the y-axis here? This is the only quiz you're going to get, by the way. I won't do it again. Training. Good. How many have graduate degrees? Or the percentage you have graduate degrees? So this is where the rich kids are. 
relatively speaking, right? And this is where the poor kids are. This is from California, Bob. I put these in here for you. Uh, exposure to aggressive peers. So remember that externalizing thing I showed you earlier. This is looking at the, the child's at two to four years old, so we're not talking about very old children, their exposure to other children, similar age, who are more aggressive in the neighborhood, in the preschool, and their friends. Crime, this is looking at uh, either injuries or fatalities from uh, gunshot wounds in Philadelphia. This is uh, brand new data, just was published in the American Journal of Public Health. Um, much more crime exposure as well as fear of crime in low-income areas in the United States. And I'm guessing it would be similar in Canada as well. So I just did a very fast, hopefully not too fast, kind of give you a feel of, well, what's the psychosocial environment like of poverty for children? Well, what about the physical environment? Well, that same daycare study that looked at the interactions with the teachers, the harsh, sensitive, detached, they also did an evaluation of the physical environment of the daycare centers. And very similarly to that other graph, there is a relationship between the characteristics of the family that are, have children in that school and the quality, the physical quality. How well designed is it? How does it have the right kind of supportive resources? This is a fascinating study. This is national data. These are, this is actually, a, it's not a sample. It's a population study of all schools in the United States. And they did an inventory of their physical quality. And what they were interested in, among other things, was what was the condition of school buildings in the US, because many of them were built a long time ago, a lot of them in the 30s, public schools, particularly on the East Coast, a little bit later on the West Coast. And they're interested in the question, well, what was just the, you know, what's the quality of the school buildings? Um, and someone had the wisdom to say, well, remember that thing about free or subsidized lunch? You could do that same kind of analysis. So someone got that data and was able to do this analysis. And what they're looking at here then is the relationship between you've got a lot of poor kids or you don't have a lot of poor kids. And this is the percentage less than adequate conditions. So this is across a whole lot of different things. They have graphs and tables of the heating and the cooling and the lighting and you know all that kind of stuff. So this is just an aggregate of that. And you'll notice something interesting here if you're observant. You'll notice that for the black bars, which are permanent additions, so renovations, you get the linearity that you, I would keep showing you, right? But for the white ones, there's a little bit going on, but it's kind of jumping around, okay? What that has to do with is when those buildings were built. So this was the original building. Most of them were built in the 20s and 30s, mid 30s. And then these are additions, which of course came later, right? So these are renovations later on. So what's happening here is this is the current percentage of the subsidized lunch, right? Which is gonna be much closer in time to the additions. Whereas when the school was built was a long time ago. So there's a little bit of a relationship there with the permanent building. Um, some of you I know are interested in nature and exposure to nature and how that might have something to do with children's health and well-being. There's certainly a lot of interesting observational data floating around that suggests that there could be something going on and at least one famous study where people were randomly assigned to gallbladder surgery in a hospital. Um, but there's reason to believe that there, this could be important. It's certainly from a moral, ethical point of view, all children ought to have similar access to resources like nature. And it may, in fact, be important for their cognitive development and maybe for their physical development. So this, as you can see, square yards of park space per child in New York City. Opportunities to be physically active. Remember the obesity slide, right? So lower income, more obesity. So this is, well, you can read the graph. So this PA is a physical activity. So at least one physical activity facility. This is the aggregate, so in the aggregate. So this is what's called an odds ratio. It's been adjusted for various kinds of background factors. So adjusting for things like, for example, income, which is interesting, household income. Independent of household income, the relative odds of having at least one physical activity facility for every 100% increase in the proportion of the population who went to college. So basically what this is telling you is if you went to college versus you didn't go to college, 
you're getting about a 200% increase in the amount of facilities where you could be physically active. And what's, what's happening here is just places you could be. So like this is uh, the YMCA, this is parks. So parks is about three times. Um, one of the reasons that there's an obesity epidemic, it's not the only reason, but one of the reasons is access to healthy food and access to physical activity. Obesity fundamentally, at a very simplistic level, right, is obviously there's a genetic component, but in terms of the environment, it's input and output, right? How much calories are coming in and how many calories are getting expended, that's pretty straightforward. So think about it, there's more obesity in lower income children. I just showed you some evidence, they have less places to be physically active. They also have fewer places to buy healthy food. So in many Western industrialized countries, like your country and my country, where do you buy healthy food unless you're really rich? You, don't, you buy it at a grocery store. You can't find it at a gas station or a 7-Eleven. They mainly are full of junk food. So look at this. So think again, sort of analogous to the language development, the toxic combination, right? Parents not talking, parent doesn't read as much, you don't have as many books, you watch more TV, you can't exercise as much, there are less places to exercise, you can't find healthy food, and what would the other ingredient be? Really easy access to fast food. This is, this is my favorite slide in the whole talk. This is McDonald's per capita. <laughs> my students changed the colors on the graph, by the way. I did, we did not change the data, but we changed the colors. <laughs> I don't think McDonald's would like this graph very much. But um, this, as you can see, it's in England and Scotland. So it's essentially looking at per capita fast food. In, uh, across the uh, x-axis, instead of, it's like uh, something like a county, it's sort of like a ward. I think that actually is what it's called. So if you're in the lowest quintile, the lowest fifth, in terms of the county or the ward where you live, you have a lot more McDonald's per capita. You also have, unfortunately, less gross, uh, I mentioned less grocery stores. You also have less pharmacies. Some of you might have heard of a concept called a food desert. There's also something called a pharmacy desert. Completely analogous to the idea. Um, housing quality, in many societies, one of the major things we use with our resources is to buy better housing. So if you don't have much money, you're going to have less quality housing. This is a very ubiquitous phenomenon. Pretty much all any society that I've been able to get data on like this, it's pretty common. Um, this is just different indices. This is U.S. data. This is just different indices of housing quality. Um, the asthma epidemic. One of the reasons that there's more asthma in uh, lower income kids is probably linked to housing, very much so, because housing conditions, one of the things that that can drive are allergens, cockroaches, for example. So this is looking at cockroach allergens, so literally the things that people respond to in that environment. One of the things I'm gonna show you a little bit later on is relationships to the uh, inflammatory or the immune system. So chronic stress, changes the way your immune system works. Unfortunately, this is another example of a toxic mix, literally, in this case, toxic. So what you have is you have more allergens, those are the things that create the allergic response, the overreaction of the immune system, and you've changed the set points for the immune system. So the inflammatory apparatus has actually been reprogrammed, probably, because of the, probably stress, and maybe also because of overexposure. Um, crowding, people per room is one way you can measure crowding. In the U.S., they use a standard of one person or more is crowded. <coughs> Moving, how often do people move? Noise, this is an interesting finding. Many of you might not remember that noise is measured in decibels. Decibels is logarithmic. So 57 to 67 would be about twice as loud. So this is again using that percentage of children eligible for a free or subsidized lunch. You can see this is British data. Actually, you can't see that. This is British data, sorry. <laughs> Traffic, where's the school located? In this case, carcinogens, 
This is one of the few that's nonlinear. If you've been watching closely, you've noticed a lot of these are linear. I didn't cherry pick that. That's a very common phenomenon. This one's not linear. I don't know why. It's, it's not. It's carcinogen emissions in, uh, of a certain scale in uh, Britain. This is more the back to the linear. This is St. Louis sulfur oxides. Lead, most of you are familiar that lead is a, a neurotoxin um, because of the famous Needleman studies where we collected children's baby teeth and then looked at IQ and other kinds of behavioral outcomes. By the way, I've learned that a lot of psychologists don't know this, but you know, Needleman not only did the IQ, do you know he had teacher ratings of behavior? I didn't know that until I st started looking into it a little bit more. The teachers clearly don't know how much lead is in their kids' teeth. And they might know which ones were maybe really poor, but they're not going to know that much about the SES. And they had ratings of things like inattention, aggression, uh, ability to stay on task, um, getting along with your peers. All of those things Needleman found relationships with lead in the teeth. So why is poverty bad for kids? I keep doing that, sorry. Um, I think because of this cumulative exposure. And I mentioned earlier that one of the reasons that this is important potentially is uh, this is Arnie Samaroff's data looking across a bunch of different studies, lots of different outcomes. So on here we have these different outcomes, qu quite a range of things. That's why I chose this slide. And here's the, this, and these are additive models. So probably they're underestimating what's actually happening because they can't take into account interactions. Either they don't have enough statistical power to do that or it's so complicated you can't understand it anyway. I can handle about a four-way interaction. After that, my brain starts to fall apart. So essentially, as you get more and more risks, as you can see, all of these various kinds of developmental outcomes, which are pretty important, um, start to get trashed. So let me tell you about a little study. This is a 20-year study that uh, my students and I have been doing, tracking families, some about half below the poverty line. Remember that 1.0, that's the federal poverty line, and 2 to 4, which is where most families are. It's rural, essentially all white, and the mother and the kid are interviewed in the home. We started, they were 8 and 9 years old. <laughs> and so the basic thing we're trying to look at here is can we begin to understand and test out maybe a little bit this idea. Maybe one of the reasons poverty is bad for kids is because of the cumulative risk exposure. So what we're going to do is we're going to track these kids over time. I've been following them for 20 years now. I'm just going to show you bits and pieces, obviously, of what we've been finding. Um, and the basic hypothesis is that one of the reasons for this link between income and these various kinds of outcomes is this cumulative risk exposure. So I've got three physical risks, which are crowding, noise, and housing quality. People per room, this is using decibel meters. This is a trained walkthrough. So I'm not asking the parents about the housing quality. People are trained how to evaluate it, and they walk through the house. This is similar to how the US does an annual housing survey. So they, I took their measure, their observational scales, and I think made them a lot better. Because were, theirs were designed to pick up on things like asthma. Uh, and these are the multiple, these are the psychosocial stressors, which are family turmoil, which is kind of what it sounds like, conflict, arguing. Um, this is a little bit misleading, not deliberately, but in hindsight. This is the child has become separated from the family. Um, mom gets hospitalized. The child gets hospitalized. Uh, exposure to violence. For those of you who are interested in violence, this is inside the home and outside the home. Um, so basically, much like the slides I showed you, poor kids have worse housing, more noise, more crowding, more turmoil, more separation, more violence. But what's really intriguing is they have a lot more accumulation. Okay, So the additive model, it, which has some problems, but it's a difficult challenge to deal with, is each stressor I dichotomize it. You're at risk or you're not at risk. This particular analysis, we use one standard deviation above the mean. So what that literally means, I take all those kids, okay, roughly 300 of them, and if they're one standard deviation above the mean in terms of people per room, you're at risk for crowding. And then do the same thing for noise, same thing. And then I add it up, so it goes from zero to six. So this is, what you're, this is the zero to six. So there's hardly any poor kids that have no risk factors, and there's no 
not rich kids, middle income kids who have five or six. And remember that graph with the cumulative risk and the developmental outcomes. So we look at, because the kind of the underlying model of this is stress and risk, tend to look at stress-related outcomes and mental health outcomes. So this is, uh, this is a pretty standard measure of children's psychological distress. It's designed for non-clinical populations, so I'm not looking at schizophrenia or it's, you know, mild depression, mild acting out, it's that kind of stuff. Um, these, remember, these are eight and nine-year-old children, okay? This is, uh, as it says, a, um, a, excuse me, it doesn't say self-report, it's self-worth. This, the child is actually evaluating themselves. So this one is a parental rating, and this, these are eight and nine-year-olds, and this is, a, this is a pretty good scale. It's called the harder competency scales, if you're familiar with it, but basically, it's an interesting way to design a scale. So it's a set of forced choices. So are you like this, or are you like this? And then whatever side you choose, are you a lot or a little? So essentially, it winds up being a four-point scale. Um, pretty effective. It looks like it works pretty well. Um, so this is a very poignant finding to me that an eight and a nine-year-old already starting to see some things with self-worth. So I'm just asking the eight or nine-year-old child to evaluate their self-worth relative to other children. The way the scale works, I didn't say that, is you're comparing yourself to the other children in your, in your class. So relative to other, what would this be, fourth graders, you ask some questions uh, around issues related to self-worth. Um, uh, those of you who are psychologists in the room know the marshmallow task. I'm not, not going to assume you're all psychologists, but uh, Walter Michel uh, was interested in um, inhibitory control, which is a component of executive functioning, uh, or he called it delay of gratification. Okay, so basically, what the way this protocol works is the child is given. Remember, these are eight and nine year olds. Uh, in my particular case, it's not marshmallows, it's a plate of candy, and there's a big plate, and there's a relatively smaller plate. And I put the big plate of candy right in front of you, like right here, you're sitting there, and I tell you, you know, if, um, first of all, I ask you, which plate of candy would you like to have, the small plate or the big plate? You don't really need to do research to get the answer to that question, obviously, right? So I, all my, I had 100% chose the big plate. I don't actually know what the normative data look like, but it's probably pretty close to 100%. So here's that big plate of candy. Um, I have to leave the room for a couple minutes to do something. If you wait until I come back, you can have the big plate of candy. But if you can't wait, you can have the smaller plate of candy, okay? And here's a little bell. And if you just can't wait, ring the bell and I'll come back. Okay, does everyone sort of understand what's going on? And, be, and you demonstrate this so the kid believes you and blah, 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 all right? And I thought about poverty and hunger, so all these kids had a snack. So this is not a hunger um, a measure. Um, so you can look at do they delay the whole time or not, which is what this is up here. And you can look at just the amount of time that they delay. So these kids at eight and nine years old have, looks like have some issues with inhibitory control. And if any of you are a preschool teachers or you know or have preschool children, I think you'll recognize how important this could be for being successful in life or certainly in school, right? If you can't delay gratification. Um, this is a task looking at persistence. It's, um, we could argue whether it's a helplessness task or not, but basically I give you a puzzle that's an interesting age-appropriate puzzle. You don't know that you can't solve it either because it's too hard or in, as they get older, it literally is impossible to solve. This one's possible, it's just too hard for them given their age. And I look at how long do you try to solve the puzzle. Um, because of the interest in stress, we also have some physiological measures of stress. These are some classic HPA axis, uh, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So here we've got looking at cortisol. This is the one most of you probably heard about. Some of you may have heard of these. These are called catecholamines over here, adrenaline and noradrenaline or epinephrine and norepinephrine. They're all the same thing, by the way. They're just whether you're in Europe or North America. Um, you'll notice this one is not statistically significant, even though it's actually the biggest. There's a lot more variance in norepinephrine. So this is an issue about the standard error. Um, but in any case, as you can see, uh, and these are overnight 
urinary hormones. What that means is this is when the child's at rest. Okay, so this is like, it's probably as close to a baseline as you're going to get. So this is not while you're under stress. I'm not doing anything with the child. This is just when they're sleeping that I'm getting these cortisol and catecholamine measures. Blood pressure is higher. Remember, these are eight and nine year old children, again, resting. They have higher blood pressure, higher stress hormones, except for norepinephrine. Now they're 13. Remember the cumulative risks? Okay. If you're very observant, you'll notice I'm losing some people out here. There's some selective attrition. Who attrits? It says something about cumulative risk. The kids with the highest risk exposure are more likely to lose them which of course probably means some of the long longitudinal things I'm gonna underestimate some of the impact. These are teacher ratings of internalizing and externalizing, a teacher rating of self-regulatory problems and behavioral problems, and this is that task persistence again. Remember, now we're at 13. Grades, cortisol, Instead of looking at the resting blood pressure, which I still do, I'm also interested in what's called reactivity and recovery. It's kind of what it sounds like. I challenge you in some way, give a speech, for example, and I look at how much does your blood pressure go up, and then I can look at how, much does it, how long does it take to come back down. So reactivity is how much does it go up, and recovery is essentially time to baseline, okay? This, the hypothesis was we're going to get more reactivity in the kids who have chronically been exposed to stress. As you can see, we got the opposite. So this is the opposite of what we predicted. I thought we were going to see more reactivity because of these kids being chronically exposed to stress. So after the fact, okay, post hoc, one possibility might be the following. If you have a system that's designed to deal with environmental demands, Right? The stress system actually, of course, is very adaptive for acute demands. That's why we have it. So you're walking through the African savanna and a saber-toothed tiger jumps out. It's really important for you to be able to mobilize really fast. So that's what that stress system is for. It's an emergency system. The closest thing for most of us would be either some kind of a crime scene or a car accident. The problem with this system is when it keeps getting turned on over time. So one post hoc possibility here is maybe if the system's getting turned on a lot, it starts to actually break down. So even though the resting levels are higher, this ability to mobilize when you need it, because remember, you're giving a speech or you're doing mental arithmetic, to mobilize it, maybe it breaks down. Again, that's post hoc. We didn't, I did not go in with that hypothesis. Here's the recovery. They're slower to recover. That makes more sense either way. So here we did predict they're going to be slower to recovery. Um, you go out and you run around a track, you ride your bike, your pulse, right? You measure your pulse, it goes up. How long before your pulse gets back down to resting? That would sort of be the analog of what we're looking at here. Instead of your pulse, it's blood pressure. So how long does it take you to get back down to the baseline? So think about what I just told you. It kind of starts to fit this post hoc idea that maybe the system's broken. They don't mobilize as well, right? They had less reactivity. But despite that, it takes them longer to get back down the baseline. So maybe another way to think about it is maybe the system's lost some elasticity. That might be another way to kind of think about it, um, both systolic and diastolic. Um, now I'll show you a little bit of data out to 17, and I'll show you a little bit out to 24. So we're just starting to do a little bit of longitudinal modeling here, as you can tell. So this is how long you've been poor from birth to that first wave. That second wave, you're 13 years old, I'm measuring your cumulative risk, and here I'm measuring something called allostatic load. I don't have enough time to get into this, but basically allostatic load, you can think of it as sort of, in a funny way, like the analog to cumulative risk, but on the outcome side. So what I'm gonna look at here is across several different physiological systems, metabolic, cardiovascular, neuroendocrine, I'm going to look at elevations across different systems, and then I'm going to aggregate that, all right? If you're interested, there's a, a book uh, 
called The End of Stress as We Know It by Bruce McEwen, M-C-E-W-E-N, if this idea int intrigues you. In medicine, this has become a very big topic because it turns out these measures predict a lot better than single risk factors. Cholesterol, for example, actually does not predict heart disease very well. But if you put cholesterol with smoking and then a couple other things, now you're really predicting heart disease. Somewhat analogous to that idea. So if you look at just blood pressure, there's a little bit going on. But if you look at blood pressure plus obesity plus the stress hormones plus some other things, that's what allostatic load is. So what I'm showing you here is that this early poverty is related to allostatic load. You know, let's round it off, say, 10 years later. And then in between, this cumulative risk. And I should mention that we have allostatic load here. So this is actually change in allostatic load. So this is prospective longitudinal data. Um, similar kind of modeling, only here, instead of looking at allostatic load, we're looking at externalizing. So 17 years old. Helplessness, that task persistence. Um, this is, look, I, th um, I think I'll skip this because of time. It's a little more complicated. I'm happy to come back to it. It's essentially looking at the link between working memory and allostatic load and poverty. Now I'm looking at 24-year-olds. I said that to give you a little bit of 24-year-old data. So now I'm looking at the internalizing and externalizing. Um, I should mention these are prospective longitudinal also. So controlling for internalizing early in your life. Let's look at the relationship between poverty early in your life and inter change in internalizing or change in externalizing. Um, and basically what we find is that there is changes in um, internalizing but not too much in externalizing. The helplessness, same thing. You get the helplessness effects and the allostatic load. Where a lot of the poverty work is right now with uh, children is neuroscience. Because given all these different things, that are, it's like a sledgehammer, right? Whatever, whatever's going on with poverty, it's affecting a lot of different things. Hopefully I've convinced you of that if you needed to be convinced of that. Or it's associated with a lot of things. I think part of the story, as I said, is stress because of cumulative risk exposure. One way to understand, well, how and why would this thing be affecting so many things might be because it's hitting the brain, right? Because all this stuff at some level is being coordinated and operated through the brain. So where a lot of the poverty work right now, not all of it, but a lot of it is sort of looking at the interplay initially between poverty or education or occupation and brain function and brain structure, and then increasingly putting together the kinds of things I'm showing you with that. I'll give you one little taste of that here. So looking at poverty, um, risk exposure, and brain, or poverty, allostatic load, and brain. That's kind of where a lot of the work is going right now. I'll just show you a little bit of that. So you have a part of your brain where the, um, the hippocampus, <clears throat> the hippocampus is really important for a lot of reasons. Certainly some memory is in there. Um, there's also cortisol, remember that stress hormone? There are cortisol receptors in the hippocampus. Um, and the amygdala is um, part of what's sometimes called the old brain, right? <clears throat> and the amygdala, and the hippocampus, you can look at them structurally and you can look at them functionally. So what you have here is hippocampal volume, okay? So this is a structural analysis as a function of income. So basically what it's showing you is that <clears throat> lower income, smaller hippocampus. Pretty robust finding. Been, I think it's been found about a dozen times now. So there's a link between early poverty and the size of the hippocampus. So that's a functional, uh, structural relationship. Uh, the amygdala is much more mixed. Um, my own reading of the amygdala and poverty are, for that matter, chronic stress. I don't think it's clear. It may be, there may be some developmental things going on. There's some reason to believe that maybe, depending on your age, you're going to see either an increase or a decrease in volume. My own reading of that is it's not clear right now. Um, now. What we're doing in this one is now we're going to do a functional 
instead of a structural. So instead of just looking at volume or thickness, we're going to actually look at the function. So we're going to give you a task, and while you're doing this task, we're going to image your brain. Okay? So what we're going to do here is we're going to image prefrontal cortex, this part, right, okay? And we're also going to be doing the same thing with the amygdala at the same time while you're doing a task. And the task that you're going to be doing is I'm going to show you emotionally evocative stimuli from a standardized stimulus set of faces that re pretty reliably evokes certain kinds of emotions. Um, I'm either going to have some neutral ones or I'm going to have some pretty negative ones. And in this particular uh, protocol, which is a standard emotion affective neuroscience protocol, I'm going to show you these things and I'm going to ask, I'm going to teach you how, I'm going to give you some examples of how to sort of regulate your response to these negative stimuli by reappraising them. So an example, there's a woman, she's standing outside of a church and she's clearly upset. She's crying, she's distraught. All right? So that's an example of the picture. So a way you might reappraise that is this is a movie and she's an actress and that she's doing this as part of her acting. So that's an example of a reappraisal and how you would actually, and in this protocol, it's, again, it's a standard uh, fMRI protocol, people are taught how to do that and they're given a little bit of practice. All right? So what you see here is a relationship between that early poverty, income to needs, and the behavior of the prefrontal cortex while this is happening. And basically what's happening is the kids who are poor, the prefrontal cortex is not working as much. It's not functioning as the way it's supposed to function. It's less active. It's not behaving in the way that you'd like it to behave. At the same time, so the prefrontal is, if you will, inhibited or not working as well. At the same time, same task, all this is in real time, the amygdala of the lower income kids is working more. So the part of the brain, to oversimplify a little bit, where the brakes are is not working as well, and the part of the brain where the gas pedal is, is working more, all right? Now think back to inhibitory control, delay of gratification, the kids are being evaluated by their teachers, they don't get along as well with other kids. The parts of the brain that we have reasonable evidence are linked to some of these things, you've got this very intriguing finding that the part of the brain that sort of helps you inhibit emotions, help you regulate behavior, help you make plans, is not functioning as well. It's not turned on as much during this task in lower income kids. By the way, these are adults, I didn't mention it. These are 24 year olds. And the 24 year olds, at the same time, the same people, their amygdala is overactive. So you can see why that could be a really toxic combination. Um, here's a little modeling where we're looking at those same outcomes and we're looking at chronic stress exposure. So here we've got early childhood, nine to 17 and then 24. So this is essentially just showing you that some of that connection that I was just describing looks like it may be operating or mediated by uh, chronic stress exposure. Now, another thing you can look at is, remember I said we've got these two parts of the brain, right? The brakes and the gas pedal. Prefrontal cortex is the brakes, amygdala is the gas pedal. Another kind of analysis you can do is called connectivity. How well are they literally, are they wired together? What's the extent of the connectivity between the two? And one of the things that we find, whoops, I'm sorry, is that the connectivity is less in the low-income kids. So the brakes don't work as well. The gas pedal comes on stronger, and literally at the, the connection, the wiring, if you will, is not as good in the lower income kids. I wanted to end with this, um, this slide. This is a really intriguing slide. So what I'm looking at here is population risk, okay? And this is in Winnipeg, Canada. And I'm looking at, um, not every child, but pretty much every child born in Winnipeg at a, in a certain time period, okay? And I'm looking at from after neonatal, okay, 
So after neonatal, help me, is neonatal one month? Does anybody remember? I always get natal and neonatal confused. Anybody, anybody remember? If you're a social epidemiologist, you would know this. I th I th it's early, okay? I just can't remember whether it's one month or six months, but after that time period, from that point on until your um, 18th birthday, including up to, up, to, up, to, up to your 19th birthday, from zero through 18, okay? How many times ever in your life in Winnipeg, it's population studies, essentially every kid born over about a 10-year period in Winnipeg, were you hospitalized? Do you understand? So it's after you've been a, a neo, the, you're not a newborn. From newborn on to being a, a young adult, were you ever hospitalized? Okay? That's the outcome. That's the dependent variable. The fa Here's the fascinating thing. Let's look at the independent variable. Low birth rate. Low APGAR. APGAR is a, uh, a test that's given to newborns. It's essentially looking at the viability, the react, how responsive, how alert is the infant, okay? Um, prematurity. So you can see that each of these predicts in your adult, in your childhood, zero to 18, the probability that you were ever hospitalized, okay? Compare that to what you would have thought. I would have thought this graph would be completely flipped over to your unmarried mom, your mom was a teenager, you have income assistance, you're on some kind of social service program, or you're not on income assistance, but you live in a low-income neighborhood. To me, this is a really powerful graph because, I don't know about you, but I would have thought, if you said to me, well, poverty, is it gonna predict things like whether you ever got hospitalized? I would have said, yeah, I think it will. But if you had then said to me, do you think it would predict better or worse than the fact that you were premature or that you were a low birth weight baby? I would have never predicted. Look at the magnitude of the difference between how well these things are predicting that sometime in your life as a child you're going to get hospitalized versus these things. I think it's a, it's a remarkably striking and, to me, counterintuitive finding. So basically what I've said is poverty is bad for kids. Hopefully I've taught you a little bit or reminded you a little bit about some of the outcomes of that for children. And I've tried to make the point that I think one of the reasons that this happens is because of this con confluence, risks coming together. And that may be one of the things that happened. And hopefully for those of you who are psychologists, I've convinced you that this is a good subject for psychologists to study. So thanks. I'm going to end there. Gary's a big boy and he can handle his own questions, but I'll stand here and pretend like I'm introducing him professionally. <laughs> so, so go ahead if you have any questions. Did I depress you all so much? You don't have any questions? Yeah, hi. I'm just wondering about this graph here. Um, I'm just wondering how mutually exclusive those I'm sorry, what? How mutually exclusive those categories are. Like, how, like, is low birth rate also really associated with having? Sure. So, How are those right. Things? So, what what this is doing is it's looking at each of these independently of the other ones. Yes. Uh, when you're talking about the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala and how they're related, and basically you showed earlier with the heart rates, there's a correlation there. I missed the I, the amygdala. That one? Yeah. So yeah. I think that, you know, like it was interesting to see, you know, the connection of the two and then your earlier slides of the heart rate. Right. You know, because your amygdala was for your um, right. fight or flight. Right, fight or flight, yeah, exactly. It's like, wow. Yeah. For me, I was like, wow. Yeah, it really starts to add together. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, um, and again, to me, it makes sense that the brain would be a big part of this because, I mean, it's probably fundamentally the most important stress mechanism is the brain. We don't think about that. We think about neuroendocrinology and cardiovascular, but most of this stuff probably get them right it's through the brain. Yeah. Got one over here. Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, so you did have a useful function. Board. You pointed out the questioner. Yeah. <laughs> hey. one, one or so, because I know some people have to go at 430. Yeah, so feel, anyone feel, if you, you need to leave, after. obviously feel free to leave them. I teach a 350 introductory class. I'm very used to people walking in and out, yeah. <laughs> Um, I have more of a methodological question. Sure. So you mentioned right in the beginning that we tend to, at least in our lab, kind of just account for socioeconomic status in our models and kind of just talk about it as this, you know, this... Nuisance. Factor, this, yeah, it's a nuisance. And it appears that it's actually a lot of the outcomes are because of this mediating role. Right. Um, so... You know, in my research looking at um, changes in mental health and behavioral problems, how would you suggest I best, you know, account for more accurately for things like... Yeah, it's a really good question. I think, of course, it, uh, it depends a lot on what your question is, right? What's yeah. the research question that you're interested in? But for me, I mean, one way to think about what I did when I had this insight was I just turned it like this. So in other words, I didn't say, let's look at this independent of all this. Let's bring it into the model. Mm -hmm. So if you find this appealing, what I would do is I would think about what your questions are and then try to think, OK, how would I then try to model that? I mean, I, I know that's not exactly what you're asking me, but that's how I would go about trying to solve that question, because I think it's a great question. And there may be times where it's perfectly reasonable and makes sense to just covariate it or have a homogeneous population. But there may be other times when you're doing that, you may be shooting yourself in the foot. Because I think a lot of what's going on here is that it's actually these things that we're all interested in studying as psychologists traditionally, that maybe why poverty is bad. And, th and one of the things that that does, of course, is it makes psychologists can't sit at the table then when we're talking about what should we do about this or how should we study it. Because we've just said, well, it's a nuisance. We're not going to study it. I guess like me perhaps quantifying the amount of variance, say, um, yeah. and then basing our models based on that. Sure. Perhaps it's more of a driving force as opposed to perhaps just a covariate. Right. Yeah. And the other thing to do is, you know, think about the kind of traditional notion of a mediator versus a covariate. I mean, statistically, they're actually the same thing, right? But one case we say, well, it's the process through which this is acting. In the other case, we think it's a nuisance, a confounding, right? And that's why we covariate. So that's why I think it has to come back to the question. Notice the other thing here, which we didn't have time to get into, is, and this, this has an analog to biology and ecology, because as sort of classically trained scientists, what most psychologists do is we isolate these one at a time, much like biology. Well, some of those biological processes, when you go out and you look in a stream, they don't work the same as they work in the lab. Okay, I'm not saying they're fundamentally different. That's not true. They are fundamentally the same, but they don't operate identically. Why? I think the cumulative risk notion kind of gets at that. And of course, that was sort of Yuri Bronfenbrenner's big point. The bioecological model of child development or development in general was, if you isolate these things, you may miss it. It's not that it's wrong, but you may miss some things because Yuri had this saying, where the action is, is in the interaction. It's kind of a neat way to sort of summarize it. It's a really good question. I think it's very hard to do it. I think it's really challenging to be a good psychological scientist and study things like this. But pers my own, obviously, I decided it's worth doing it. But I think, I don't know, I just feel like we shouldn't walk away from that. To me, it, I mean, hopefully I've convinced you it's, there's something going on there. We might not know exactly what it is or what's in the box, but there's certainly that box is powerful. So I think for our psychologists to walk away from that because we can't always manipulate the variable or we can't control everything. By the way, we can start to manipulate it through natural experiments, like um, programs that increase income or return more money to families. And um, most of those random or semi-random um, experiments or quasi-experiments I would say, in general, they show about the same thing as these kind of more observational. They're not identical, but they so Depends on what the outcome is. Some of them actually show when you do that, it's more powerful. Depends on what the outcome is. But it's challenging. I mean, if you're trained as an experimentalist and you want to take on something like this, it's not easy. But I hopefully I've convinced you it's interesting, if nothing else, right? And, and, yeah. Dialogue, if that's broken down, there's a degradation, right? Now, if you're doing external play, like say 
and a child looks like playing all the time. I hadn't thought about that. That's an intriguing um, idea. Because you're not talking to the child and they're, they're being full of time play. Right. And there's a dialogue, right? Right. 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 Yeah. That's a re really intriguing idea. I haven't thought about that. Probably also very age dependent, obviously, too, right? Yeah, and the age of the child, yeah. If you have to go, go. Don't feel, don't wor be worried to be polite. It's no problem. And those who want to stay and talk some more, I'm happy to stick around. You know, American stereotype of Canadians is that you're all very polite. Do you know, are you aware that that's an American stereotype of Canadians? Okay. I think I know what some of your stereotypes are of us, but we could check that out too if you want. <laughs> well, feel free to leave if you need to, and feel free to stay and talk some more if you want to. Yes, sir. So we see a lot of evidence for a relationship at least between poverty and negative outcomes, but what are some of the likely repair routes either that are on the way or that you think will happen? Uh, interventions, what to do? Is that the question? Yeah. I'm going to show you a slide that's what I'm doing this. Usually I get asked, you didn't ask this question, so I'm not accusing you of asking this question, but usually I get asked some question around the concept of resilience, okay? So basically, I think most of you are familiar with this concept, but basically this is, um, you're at risk for a negative outcome, you're a poor kid, for example, and what, for those kids who are poor but who do okay, that would be the resilience. You do better than expected, right? Um, so I want to say two things. So one is, and even though this isn't the question you want to ask, this is, this is the only part I'll preach at you, okay? I've tried not to preach. I don't think I have. This part I'll preach for a minute. There's a real problem with resilience, and here's the basic problem. It does not predict outcomes very well. What predicts the outcomes well is the risk exposure. Here's a really a nice study. I'm looking at grades from kindergarten through high school as a function of your IQ, or as a function of risk exposure. Now, I bet a lot of you would have put your money on IQ, and you would have, been, you would have lost the bet. Look at the graph, OK? So risk is more powerful than the resilience factor. Now, in terms of the question, I think two things that I would say. One is, if it's true that part of what's going on is this cumulative risk exposure, I think that means that the way that, at least in America, I suspect it's similar in Canada, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the traditional way we approach dealing with children with various kinds of needs, including children at risk, is we treat them um, sort of we, by singular risk factors. So we look at nutrition, we look at parenting, we tend to silo. We tend to separate all those things. If the cumulative risk is what's, if that's a part of what's happening, to me that leads to an intervention strategy that's very different. So it's much more multifaceted, dealing with a lot of, a lot of these issues at one time. Um, the other thing that um, most of those programs are not sensitive enough to because it's so complicated is the whole issue of the age of the child. So for example, if you're worried about executive functioning, probably the age at which you're introducing some kind of intervention might be very different than if you're interested or concerned about um, obesity, for example. So I can't answer your question directly other than to say I think the programs that are likely to be most effective are going to look at multiple risks and trying to mitigate that risk exposure. Um, and this idea of being developmentally appropriate and sensitive. The other thing I would say is probably the most effective and maybe even the most cost of effective way to do this would be to increase income, which in the United States is a hard sell because that sounds like socialism, right? So you're not supposed to do that in a hyper-capitalist society. Um, or back to my comment about that the slope of the line is a way to judge societies. So what would, what, another way to answer your question, another way to think about your question, which is a really important question, is, well, what could you do to change the slope of that line? The slope of that line is still, looks the same in Sweden, Denmark, but the slope is less. So there is some evidence that the slope of that line does seem to uh, 
be associated with the generosity of social welfare systems, and particularly the ones that wind up putting more money either directly or through tax credits or, or support systems in low-income families. So in the U.S., we have this thing called the Nurse Practitioner Partnership, where low-income families, it's an experiment in the U.S., can have a public health nurse go home with the mom f at, at, from the hospital, literally, and then in the beginning of the child's life for longer, more days, and then as the child gets older, it kind of phases out. In Sweden, every child goes home with a public health nurse. It's not income-based. And what Sweden has done when they've done the cost-effective cost analysis, it's actually easier and cheaper to have that program be universal than to have it be targeted. The, uh, in Sweden, they don't have subsidized and free lunches. Everybody has a free lunch in Sweden. It's not income-based. Um, and what, again, they've discovered the same thing. It's more cost-effective. The other thing that's interesting about that is it removes all the stigma issues. So the kids who are getting the free lunch, the kids and my son in third grade, he knew who got free lunch and who got subsidized lunch. He even knew that distinction, which blew my mind. And he knew what kids were paying for lunch. In, in Sweden, everybody's, and um, so that's not a direct answer to your question, but it at least tells you something about the parameters, I think, that might be important. That's funny. I, you know, I think when I was a kid, there was a Everybody had a free lunch in the States. I Maybe think, I don't think that's accurate. You don't think so? No. <laughs> I mean, maybe California? Yeah, yeah, you grew up, we grew up in different parts of the country. I grew up in New Jersey, you grew up in California. So it might be true, but I don't think you're right. Right, if, you're, if you have continuing interest, there actually is a phase two to this. Oh, I forgot about that. List. We don't know exactly where it is, but it's on the first floor of Coronet, like downstairs. Oh,